Energy Media Readers, we are going to be talking to Ian Hussey, who's the head of research at the Parkland Institute at the University of Alberta, about a commentary that he wrote in which he said that investing in the Keystone XL pipeline is actually better for the oil companies that will be shipping oil through it, and not so good as not as good as maybe it would have been in the past for Albertans and for workers. And uh, welcome to the interview, Ian. Thanks for having me. Now, I, I thought this was a really interesting idea, and it's kind of uh, fits with some of the work that I've, I've done. And why don't you just start by giving us an overview of your commentary? Yeah, okay. Um, at the end of last week, I, I wrote a commentary on the Keystone XL investment and, and who benefits the most from that. And I think, um, first and foremost, uh, Keystone XL, uh, sorry, uh, TC Energy, the owner of Keystone XL, um, is going to benefit. They, uh, they would not be able to, to start building the pipeline uh, in, in 2020. Uh, it's not really clear when they would have been able to start if they had to finance it themselves. Um, and so they're able to start that. They're um, hoping to finish it in 2023. Um, and, and so they are a large beneficiary of, of Premier Kenny and the UCP government's decision to invest in Keystone XL. I think the other big winners are the major oil sands producers, uh, Suncor, CNRL being the two biggest ones, but you would also put in there Imperial, Husky, and Synovus, maybe a, a couple others. Um, and, and they're going to fill up most of Keystone XL. And so what I was saying in my commentary is, is they're going to benefit because um, in, in recent months, we had about 400,000 barrels a day in crude by rail, much of which is going to be displaced by new pipelines, either Line 3 coming online in the next year or two, and, and especially Keystone XL. So uh, really, we're talking about five to 10 companies that are really going to benefit, and, and therefore, their shareholders are going to benefit too. Now, the, there's a really key point here, and you talk in your commentary about labor productivity, so you touch upon it, and that is that, uh, let's say even uh, 10 years ago, when oil production went up or gas production went up, employment went up. But with the introduction of new digital technology, technologies, labor productivity has increased, so you can produce the same amount or more oil with the same number of workers or even fewer workers. So that link between rising production and rising employment essentially has been broken. Absolutely. I, I think the oil industry has um, changed dramatically in the last 10 years, let alone the last five years. I think that's been a structural change, meaning uh, the industry has changed forever. And part of that is using uh, advancements in either software technology uh, to optimize facilities operations or new uh, engineering technology or just materials technology to make materials uh, break down less, which means you have uh, facilities um, stopping for less time, which means they get to operate more and, and thus produce more oil. Uh, and with uh, engineering, if you design facilities to be uh, the same, like an IKEA version of the oil sands where you can produce a facility once um, and, and, and then construct it several times, um, such as Husky Energy is doing with its in-situ facilities, then you're looking to, to reduce uh, labor costs in, in the production of facilities as well. And so all of those things together, materials, engineering design, as well as software in facilities, is leading companies to be able to produce more oil with, with less labor and, and ultimately less cost, not just for labor, but also for materials and, and other matter as well. Well, Ian, that leads us to another question. This will be my last one, but I think it's maybe the most important one. There was a, a pact, if you will, between Albertans who, through their government, own the resource and the companies like the five that you mentioned and others uh, who uh, get to go in and exploit that resource and are supported by you know, policy and so on. And the pact is, we'll let you do that as long as we benefit as workers and as, uh, as Albertans, uh, you know, we get the tax money into the government uh, so that we can have uh, infrastructure and services and all of that. So you get jobs and you get services out of that, uh, the, that kind of development. But that pact seems to be broken because the number of workers is declining, labor productivity is going up as you just mentioned, and revenues to the government are falling as well. 
So we've seen, you know, I, I had one interview where the commentator said, you know, maybe it's time to rethink the pact. If, they, if the Albertans aren't, aren't benefiting, maybe we need to take a different approach to this resource. What's your take? Yeah, I, I think the deal has changed. I, I think what you're talking about is a, a pact that was struck uh, in the mid 1990s, um, when Premier Ralph Klein uh, put together an advisory panel of industry leaders, and and they advised the premier on a number of things that have become commonplace in Alberta's oil sands. So, our royalty system comes from that mid 90s uh, consultancy between Premier Klein and energy leaders, as well as a number of other ways that the government of Alberta relates to the industry. Now, you fast forward uh, 25 years later. And we're looking at an industry that is providing uh, maybe 5% of uh, Government of Alberta's revenue through royalties. It was in the 30 to 40% of Government of Alberta annual income in, in the early 2000s, and it's gone down to 5%, you know, 15 to 20 years later. Um, if you look at uh, corporate income taxes, the big five uh, oil sands producers that I mentioned, like Suncor and CNRL, uh, they've said through Premier Kenny's uh, corporate income tax that they're going to save uh, $4.3 billion between 2019 and 2022. Um, and then, of course, you look at the jobs aspect of that. Um, and, of course, jobs have gone down dramatically in the last five years. We're looking at um, the, the national number is over 50,000 jobs. In Alberta, we're looking at 35,000 jobs have been terminated since uh, fall of 2014 to the beginning of 2020. And, and so industry has changed and, and they need less workers to actually produce more bitumen. And, and, and so um, perhaps government, uh, both provincially and municipally and federally, want to look at that structural change in the industry and think about whether the government wants to interact with the industry differently at this point compared to say, running the same uh, government tax rates and royalty rates that were established in uh, the mid nineties in the case of Alberta. I'll finish with this comment, uh, uh, Ian. Uh, that is one thing that's happened since the, you know, the past year since the <clears throat> Kenny, the UCP uh, formed government mm -hmm. is that this idea that if we just change governments, if we just change policies, the industry will come back. Uh, that talking point has been exploded. There is, there's no, we now know, I didn't think there was any legitimacy to it, but that now we know there's no legitimacy to it. And I think that this idea that, it, that we, uh, the industry is experiencing structural change driven by changes at the global level that we have no control over, uh, it's something I've been beating on the drum for for the last uh, two, three years. But I think we really need to get that into the, uh, the Alberta narratives, the po political narratives, the public narratives that, you know, uh, dominate our, our public discourse. Absolutely. I, I think if you look at uh, your work, uh, a number of other people that are commenting on Alberta's energy industry, uh, we're, we're trying to have a public conversation about the best policy and not necessarily in a partisan way, really looking at um, there are some positive things that Premier Notley did with her government, and there's some things perhaps that, that we would question and, and, and perhaps change. I think the same thing is true for Premier Kenny. I think it's become very clear to your point that uh, the Premier of Alberta does not control world energy prices and, and a number of other things that would affect uh, our energy industry, such as getting pipelines built, unless, you know, of course, if a Premier is willing to uh, invest billions of dollars in a pipeline. But still, uh, the, the government of Alberta's ability to affect uh, the world en en energy industry is, is almost zero, right? So it, it really doesn't matter the party that's in place. We, uh, I, the UCP can, can pass good energy policy just like the Alberta NDP can. And I think it's a question of uh, the public conversations going around that. And, and really at this point, the, the pertinent question is what do we do now? Right, we're five years after the 2014 crash. We've seen 35,000 jobs leave Alberta. We've seen tens of billions of dollars leave in investment in the energy industry. There are serious questions about if, if jobs or investment are going to come back, and and perhaps uh, we need different policies in Alberta and in Canada to deal with that current situation, as well as those structural changes we've been talking about that have been happening in the Alberta oil sands industry. 
Ian, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to chatting with you about this topic again in, in the near future. Absolutely. Thank you very much.